Have you seen the headlines? Nintendo's forecast is cloudy, and the only thing that could have saved the company was the biggest flop in its history. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, the show that doesn't need an intro joke this week because... Virtual Boy! Look, it's a joke that writes itself! This overpriced, headache-inducing, non-portable, portable gaming device from 1996 failed on every level, sold only 770,000 units, and has gone down in gaming history as the worst game console of all time. Sure, arguments can be made for the Philips CDI, the Nomad, the Tiger R-Zone, but seriously, no one expected this steaming red and black turd to come from the biggest name in gaming. Now, 19 years after its release, Nintendo has long since forgotten these god-awful goggles. The thing is, they shouldn't have, because the Virtual Boy was the one thing that could have saved the company from its current hardships. Don't believe me? You will. Let's start by reviewing all the reasons reasons why the Virtual Boy flopped. First, these. Everyone hates these. Sure, obligatory battery breaks might be beneficial for my health as I'm forced to get out of my couch's well-maintained butt groove, but nothing kills a play session quite like having to stop every few hours to recharge. The Virtual Boy inhaled double A's faster than a binge-eating Kirby. Nintendo, I swear, must have had a deal with the Energizer Bunny, cause I kept going and going and going back to the store to buy more packages of these darn things. Which brought up another problem, the cost. Nintendo had always operated on the philosophy that good gaming didn't need to be expensive, but that belief went out the window with the Virtual Boy. Batteries, chargers, visits to the chiropractor for your next train, all those added to the already high $180 price tag. A price unheard of for a portable gaming system back in 1996. And what kept the Virtual Boy's cost too damn high was the technology. 3D ain't cheap, my friends, regardless of the decade. In fact, the infamous decision to make the graphics all red was a call purely made on cost. Having a single color was just cheaper, but apparently not cheap enough to make it affordable. And what's worse than expensive technology? Expensive, rushed technology. According to David Sheff's book Game Over, the lead developer on the Virtual Boy never actually intended for the console to be released in the form it ended up in. What showed up on the shelves of Toys R Us was practically a prototype, so why release it? Well, Nintendo pushed the system to market so it could focus development resources on something else, codenamed Project Reality, later known as the Nintendo 64. Clearly the right move, but that means Nintendo was perfectly comfortable letting customers overpay for a half-finished system. A half-finished system, mind you, without games. Literally, there were 22. 14 in the US. Launch titles? Don't make me laugh. There were four. Now tell me which of these gems would get you to a midnight release. Red Alarm, Teleroboxer, Galactic Pinball, and Mario Tennis. And the best part of all, of the 14 games, none of them actually fulfilled the virtual reality part of Virtual Boy. Oh sure, there was a 3D effect here or there, but no one knew how to program for the thing. In fact, Nintendo went out of their way to make it difficult for the games to get made. In 1995, a year before Virtual Boy launched, a Nintendo game designer openly admitted that very few third-party publishers had seen the system, because Nintendo wanted to control what type of games were getting released, worried that there might be a glut of low-quality games headed to their new system. <laughs> what? Excuse me? You were worried about crappy games and yet Waterworld got your seal of approval? Well, congratulations, Big N. Your discerning taste crippled a system that barely had a leg to stand on in the 
first place. In summary, Virtual Boy crashed and burned because of poor battery life, overpriced technology that was rushed to market, and a lack of quality games, particularly at the system's launch. Sound familiar? It should. Nintendo repeated the same story in 2012 with this. The Wii U. Now, I'm a huge Nintendo fan, so it pains me to say that sales for this have been abysmal. Since its release back in 2012, 2012, hard to believe it's been that long, only about 5.8 million Wii U's have been sold. Certainly better than the Virtual Boy's 770k, but you know how many PS4's have been sold? 5.4. 3 million in four months! Right now, the system is an anchor around the company's neck, being a primary contributor to three years of losses, $1.2 billion of Nintendo money quite literally lost in Minus World. Reggie's body may have been ready, but his pocketbook certainly wasn't as the company went from printing money with the Wii to bleeding it. And ironically enough, the Virtual Boy predicted the failure of the Wii U nearly two Two decades earlier for all the reasons we just reviewed. Let's go down the list. Battery life. Nowadays we have fancy charging stations, but at three and a half hours of playtime per session, the Wii U's tablet controller just doesn't cut it. Cost. At launch, the Wii U was $300 for the cheapest version, but if you want a battery that'll last more than a few hours, that'll cost ya. You want a regular remote to play the games that work better without a tablet? That'll cost ya. You want a game to play since, you know, it didn't even have the decency to come bundled with anything? Well, that'll cost ya too. Both the Wii U and the Virtual Boy before it broke with Nintendo's history of keeping costs low, instead featuring price tags that ballooned significantly via hidden costs for things necessary to get the system to function. And ask yourself one question, why is the system so expensive in the first place? Overpriced technology. Remember the Virtual Boy's decision to go with the color red to save on production expenses? Nintendo relived its own history with the Wii U, once again sacrificing graphics, this time competitive HD graphics, just so it could bundle a freaking iPad as a controller. In a year, two, that could probably be done on the cheap cheap, but as it stands, just like the Virtual Boy, the Wii U was rushed to market. Look at its history. In 2010, Nintendo of America President Reggie My Body Is Ready commented that he felt, quote, confident that the Wii home entertainment console has a very long life in front of it, end quote, and declared that a successor would not be launched in the near future. And then again, at E3, the 2010 presentation, Nintendo's CEO revealed to the BBC that they would begin announcing a new console once Nintendo ran out of ideas with the current hardware. Apparently, they didn't have too many ideas left since less than a year later, the Wii U was announced as Nintendo rushed to stay ahead of the console war curve. And now the games. Oh boy, the games. Look at these launch titles. All names that had appeared long before on an older and quite frankly, more high definition system. Games that had tablet functionality shoehorned in because it's a game for the Wii U, damn it! Just like the Virtual Boy's 3D virtual namesake, no one's using the Wii U technology correctly. Not even Nintendo. Games like Assassin's Creed and COD weren't built for asymmetric gaming. And Mario U? Congratulations on having the tablet. You get to be everyone's favorite character from the series, the platform creator. And that's the main issue here. Remember when I mentioned that I'm a huge Nintendo fan? Well, keep that in mind, because if we're really going to be honest, at its core, it's the idea of both these systems that's flawed. Both the Wii U and the Virtual Boy were systems that, at their best, were innovation for innovation's sake, and at their worst, were founded on a gimmick. Let's pursue 3D gaming for one, and let's focus on asymmetric gaming for the other. Now don't misunderstand me, there's nothing wrong in experimenting with gimmicks, trying new things. Unless you're a company that wants to make money, in which case there's a lot wrong with it. You see, corporations want a big fat profit as quickly as possible. Porting a game from one HD system to another? Easy money! Change some code! But porting a game from an HD system to something that requires some sort of extra screen integration means figuring out new creative, using more resources, hiring more people, and ugh, forget it! Assassin's Creed 5! 
Assassin's Creed 6, Assassin's Creed 1 Remastered. Quite frankly, not everyone is as ambitious as you, Nintendo. Making games for a system that breaks from the norm means extra work for third-party publishers, and extra work means their bottom line gets smaller. And Nintendo, you should have known this by now if you had paid attention to the Virtual Boy. No one made games for that thing. No one wanted to make games for that thing. Because no one knew how to make games for that thing, and didn't want to invest the time and money it took to figure it out. And why should they dedicate development dollars to create a whole new way to experience games when coming up with a few new level designs for Call of Duty Space Zombies will be faster, cheaper, and end up selling more than any game ever? I don't know what pony and rainbow-filled world you live in, Nintendo, but companies like EA, they're not doing this for the sake of art. Third-party developers bail out of innovative systems, and that leaves you, Nintendo, you and the creators of Waterworld 3D, solely responsible for filling in the growing number of blanks in the release calendar. And looking at the slow trickle of Wii U games, the non-existent Virtual Boy library, that pressure isn't something you can handle. In short, the Wii U has failed for the exact reasons the Virtual Boy did 20 years ago. They're both overpriced gimmicky systems that were rushed to market with no games and no real plan for games. But there's one other side to this story, one that turns this entire situation on its head. Sure, it's easy to blame Nintendo, but Nintendo may not be the one at fault here. We, the gamers, are. More on that next time. But for today, regardless of who ends up with the final blame, Nintendo's the one who's going to have to deal with the consequences. So good luck. You're gonna need it. And remember, Nintendo, those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. The Virtual Boy, the Wii U, for all the hate that's piled on these systems and others like it, are we really the ones to blame? Make sure you subscribe so that way you're notified when we complete this duology of videos. Do you get a supreme sense of schadenfreude from bashing on crappy video game systems? Well, excuse me, loyal theorists. The channel All Time Tens was kind enough to promote us game theorists on their top 10 countdown of the worst video game systems. It sure would be swell of you to click right here, watch their video, and show them our appreciation. Tell them MatPat sent ya. But if you're the rare breed of gamer who doesn't appreciate a good top 10 countdown, instead deciding to stick around here, did you know that sound can pop your head at any moment without warning? If you missed our theory on Mortal Kombat's death by sound, check it out here. And don't worry, Super Card Tournament returns next episode.